entitled, When Things Go Wrong. <laughs> you know, I was going to entitle it When Things Go Right, but, you know, then nobody would listen because nobody wants to listen when things go right, you know. We, wanna, we don't want things to go wrong, you know. That way we can prove that we're suffering. <laughs> I don't know if that's correct or not. But anyhow, sometimes speakers, preachers, exhorters or whatever will talk about subjects that they really have no personal experience with. Now, a- again, as a pastor, preacher, exhorter, whatever, you can't live long enough to experience everything. <laughs> you can't live long enough to experience every bad thing and every good thing. But um, the challenge is for us that we know that Jesus Christ has experienced those things. He has gone through every, every physical problem, every emotional difficulties, every spiritual difficulties, every, every one that could confront us as a human race, Jesus went through in his life and particularly in uh, the garden and with the disciples forsaking him and, you know, the religious ru- rulers conspiring and, you know, crucifying him and the Romans beating him. I mean, we can go on and on. But I was thinking of when things go wrong, the times of crises and times of change. I was, I was thinking of, uh, for myself, we, we started out going to Maine <laughs> a long time ago, uh, and w- it was a time of change because we went to northern Maine, and in northern Maine there were only one group of believers that they were all going to heaven, and anybody else that didn't belong to their group wasn't going to heaven, and anybody that was south of the Maine border couldn't be saved. <laughs> It was just, you know, they were just that black and white. But we went there, and we started a, a prayer group in the convent, <laughs> you know, and, um, and it worked out very well. We had a few, two or three nuns and uh, a couple priests and 10, 15 townspeople, and that prayer group is still going on. But it was a time of change. So then we came back to uh, Katani, and we, wanted, we felt that it was a time to start a church. So we started a church in Katanning, and that church is still going on. And, you know, some of the people that I went to high school with got saved in that church. You know, so it's still going on. It's doing very well. It's a time of change. We come to Wimber. <laughs> it's a time of change. Hospice was coming and, you know, new, you know a whole different type of health care and then counseling and then the building programs and the church. It was a time of change, and all those things have come. So... And, and then, of course, as a chaplain, you experience <laughs> many different experiences of uh, sorrow, suffering, crises. You know, hospice chaplain, you run in, you know, you're bringing people into the program with a limited life expectancy. So what are we going to do with things when they go wrong? So I wrote a book, buy the book, and you have the answer. LAUGHTER yeah, here we are. We got pastors selling a book, you know. But <laughs> the idea is, um, when I felt that I was no longer going to be able to do all those things, um, I really felt that maybe writing a book would be helpful. So that's kind of the motive behind why I wrote the book. And of course, uh, but we'll go on from there. It's important to note that whenever things go wrong, what are the first things that we do? Now, one of the the um, important things is that how we handle little crises is how we're going to handle big crises. You know, if you're prone to, you know, you, you, you break your finger now and you lay on the floor and cry, when something bad happens, really bad, you're going to lay on the floor and cry. I mean, you know, how you handle things, the little things, is how you're going to handle the big things. So the challenge is for us to understand what makes us tick. I always use the illustration um, that um, when kids, you know, you know, teenagers, oh, teenagers, you know. Uh, one doctor said, teenagers, and you know what happens with teenagers? There's this worm, worm, you know, a little worm, worm, gets in the back of their head and goes right up into their brain and eats up all common sense. <laughs> you know, that was his definition of a teenager. Everything common and good, you know, this they know they're supposed to just w- disappear. The worm went in there and ate it. Well, one of the challenges was always, what do you do with somebody who won't listen? They All they do is slam the door. Well, <laughs> the challenge is, go back to where we were talking to them, and what is it that made them upset? So it isn't controlling the door, it's c- 
thinking through what got them blew up, how they blow up or whatever. So in our thinking, what and, what and how? What happened that made me so upset? What makes it so that I can't continue the way I'm going at, without slamming the door? You know, adults, <laughs> grown-ups have never... <laughs> You know grown-ups that slam doors? I don't know if you know them, but, you know, I've seen a few, you know, you know in my travels, you know. <laughs> but the idea is that we, we have to understand what makes us, how we understand things. And generally, it's whenever we have this concept, this understanding that this is a pillar, all right? We have a pillar. And this is what's supposed to happen because this is what's supposed to happen. And when that gets crushed, we blow up. Hmm. Now, people who don't blow up and they become stuffers is like dynamite down a hole. Sooner or later, it's going to blow up and it's going to be a big explosion. <laughs> so the challenge is for us not to, put, not to be stuffers, but to be dealers. And sometimes we have to just sit back and reflect and what is it? that I'm going through, what is it that I'm experiencing, and what was I expecting to happen, and what happened that it didn't happen, and then how was my response. So we're always looking at controlling an action. Remember the story of the little kid sitting in church, or it wasn't sitting, he was standing up in church, and he told him to sit down, he said he wouldn't. So finally they went over and grabbed him and sit him down. He says, well, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside, you know? <laughs> and so that's kind of how it is, you know? And so We've, we've, we've controlled a behavior, but we haven't solved the problem. So, when things go wrong, how do, we do, how do we solve the problems? Well, for Christians, for us, we have Jesus Christ to help us, and he is the solid rock, he is the foundation of our life and of our faith, and we, we are on a solid rock already. People who don't have Christ have nothing solid beneath them. So when crises come, their crises just collapse upon the sand, and, you know, any storm just washes it away, and it's like standing in the sand of the seashore that you keep sinking and you don't know where the bottom is. For a Christian, we have Jesus Christ, the solid rock, and we build our principles upon Christ. And when something comes to seemingly crush those principles, we only go so far <laughs> because Jesus is there, to sustain us and help us. So we have someone to help us. So as a believer, we're not left to our own resources to cope with problems and to cope with our difficulties. God is able to turn everything around to the long-range good. Now, <laughs> some individuals, I mean, the idea that all things are, originate with God. No. Some, some problems originate with people. And sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's in unintentional. But the challenge is, no matter where it comes from, we have to deal with it in a way that doesn't slam the door. <laughs> because often when we slam the door, our fingers are in it. <laughs> and then when the fingers are in it, we get even more upset. <laughs> and we're mad at the people for making us slam the door on our fingers. I had this one, and this is a true story, I had this one child that in, in counseling um, that his, his mother and he came in, and, and the child wa had no responsibilities. I mean, absolutely none. The child fell over his toys. He said, it's not my fault. If my mother had picked them up, I wouldn't have fallen. And guess what mom said? He's right. I left the room. So, <laughs> But you see, pe people have different perspectives of how they are to handle things, and so what's going on is we have to look at and examine, you know, mother has to look at and examine what it means to be a parent, and child has to recognize they have responsibility to pick up their toys, and if they fall over something, it's not mother's fault. And, you know, I had a, we had an older lady, I mean, she was probably in her 90s, and uh, she fell and broke her arm. And I said to her, well, what happened? She said, God pushed me. So here's that little five-year-old blaming mother for not picking up the toys, and here's a 90-some-year-old blaming God for pushing her down and breaking her arm. And she was serious. 
And after I visited, she, I said to her, well, what does he want me to pray for? Pray that God would heal my arm. Whoa. <laughs> Do you know how mixed up we can be in our analyzing and figuring things out? So what do we do with it? Well, God's ultimate goal is to bring us from where we are, who we are, to, to be more like Jesus. Now, that is a hard process because God is good and we are stubborn. <laughs> God is good and we just can't figure out why we have to do it this way. Well, God is, his ultimate goal is to make us like Christ. By becoming more like Jesus, we discover our true selves. You know, forgive. <laughs> forgive ourselves, forgive others. Allow God to forgive us, grace, mercy. God's purpose for his people was not an afterthought. <laughs> Used this in Sunday school. Said that God's plan for your life didn't start last week. It's like, oh, David, I forgot about you. I'll get you, I'll write you in. <laughs> you know, I'll write you in. You know, we'll put that together for you. And we'll get a good plan for the rest of your life. I'm sorry I messed up the first 50 years, 60, 70, 70 years. <laughs> sorry I messed up those 70 years, but we'll get it started. We'll get it fixed sooner or later. Uh, you know, it's just a little glitch. No, God had a plan before the world began for each of our lives, and God has a plan and a purpose, and he did not wait until last week to suddenly put it in. So God has, has a plan ongoing. Now, our plan is our understanding only goes so far. We only understand so much. We got our little block of life and understanding, and, and this is where we live, and this is how things go, and this is how we understand, and this is where we've been living, and we've been living all this time, so it must be right. <laughs> it must be right the way I live because I'm still living and nobody's hit me over the head yet but that's another story Romans 8 so Paul begins this, this um, discourse here to the Romans now if you want to have <clears throat> again I can't overemphasize this the, the Sunday school lesson on Ephesians is just wonderful so I'm bragging on the text <laughs> not on the presenter the text in, Roman, in Ephesians chapter 2 and 3 or is our last two weeks of Sunday school. Do yourself some good and uh, listen to those. So today we're looking at Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Paul says, in the face of all this, so he's gone through this discourse of many things going on and position in Christ and all things working together and, and, and all that coming here before this, this section of scripture. And he says, in the face of all this, what is there left to say? If God is for us, who can be against us? So in the face of everything that's going on in the world, we have to plant our feet on the solid rock. And the rock Christ Jesus means that God has a plan and a purpose, and we won't have enough sense or foresight to understand God's ultimate goal in all the world that's going on around us in politics and <laughs> and personal life, the neighbors, and the, the town, and the community. We don't have it. We don't have all that. But, God's, but Paul says here, God is for us who can be against us. So that is a declaration that we have to understand. Who's against us? Well, actually, it doesn't matter. The challenge is for us to remember. Now, <laughs> the title of my lesson is When Things Go Wrong. We have to remember then, what are the things that are right, not wrong? So the thing that is right is for us to understand who can be against us. And now this is Paul speaking by, and the Holy Spirit is inspiring this, who can be against us? We have to define that. Now, it doesn't matter if the devil himself is against us, God is for us. See, we have to decide. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge between faith and fear. It's a challenge between grace, mercy, and love, and bitterness, vengefulness, and evil. And we have to decide which one we're going to think on. So who can be against us? He did not hesitate. He that did not hesitate to spare his son 
but gave him up for us all. Can we not trust such a God? Whoa, wait a minute. He did not, Jesus did not spare himself. He didn't spare himself, but came to be the sacrifice for our life. Can we not trust such a God who would, who would do everything godly possible? <laughs> not humanly possible. Godly possible to save us from our sins. Can we not trust such a God to give us with him everything else that we need? <laughs> that we must trust him that with him he will give us everything that we need. You see, God is for us. He spared nothing to redeem us from, the, from our sins. Can we not trust God to have a plan and a purpose? See, we have our plans, and sometimes our plans and purposes get crushed. Oh. So we must understand God has a plan that's even better than what got, just got crushed. So we don't have to blow up on God and blow up on ourselves and blow up on others. We have to understand that we're back down to the foundation, and this is what really keeps us. So when things, when things go wrong, do, do not undermine your faith. Do not undermine your experiences. Do not undermine your relationship with Jesus. Some people just say, oh, God's against me. God, you know, start off on that litany. No, don't go there. Verse 33. I like this, this, this start. I have about 12 pages, and I doubt if I'll get through three. But anyhow, <laughs> verse 33. He who, excuse me, this is very important, who would dare to accuse us? See, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, and Paul saying to us, who is going to dare accuse you? Jesus is saying to all the courts of heaven, all the demons of hell, he says to them all, who is going to step forward and accuse them? Step out. Let me, let me talk to you. <laughs> it's, it's, Jesus, and he's not, he didn't, you know, it's like the, well, you know. He's, he, they, don't have, they don't have a, let's see, the, the devil himself is the accuser of the brethren, and he only does that, only has access to God for a period of time. And, you know, at the judgment, it seems like he will be the one who is the accuser, that with the, the people whose lives are not written in the book of life, they'll have another book of all the things that their life has done. And the, 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 their, life ac their life actions and attitudes will be their accuser. But for those who are forgiven, there's nothing in the book except forgiveness and love, the names of the book of life and by the grace of God. And so those who are in the book of life, Jesus is telling us, who would dare accuse you? Whom God has chosen. <laughs> you are chosen by God. Who's going to accuse you? So whenever we get down on ourselves and start the accusations, we need to stop and realize that's not God. He would not dare accuse you because he doesn't, re he doesn't have anything to accuse you of. So when we start the litany of all the things we failed, God doesn't have that in his book. It's been washed away. Paul the apostle, was once Saul of Tarsus. And he knows that Saul of Tarsus is dead. He remembers what he did, and he speaks of it different times, but he also knows who he is now in Christ. And he writes to us about it. <laughs> the judge himself has declared us free from sin. Now this is, this is a legal term. It's like this is a legal document that has been signed and right you now these are these are you know when Paul is writing this it's it's like referring to the court system where the judge uh, has written things out and he is saying that the judge himself has declared us free from sin you are free from sin and who is in a position to condemn only Christ and Christ died for us so here we have this 
Christ is the one who we is ultimately we are all accountable to. And if there's anyone who is going to accuse you, it would be Jesus Christ. But guess what? He did not come to accuse us. He came to save us. He died for us. He rose for us. He reigns in power for us. And what does he do? He prays for us. He ever lives to intercede for us. So when things go wrong, remember what is right. Verse 35. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? So when things go wrong, we need to remember there is nothing that can separate us from God's love in Christ. Impossible. Can't happen. No matter how we feel, no matter what has happened, we are still in his love. We are still in his place where we are surrounded. We finished our Sunday school lesson with Paul talking about how that we enter into the presence of God. There's no height. I mean, the height, the depth, the length, uh, the width is so vast we can't even imagine. And so we enter into that love and it is, we are escorted in there by Jesus Christ. Wow. So here we are. Can, can, can trouble, pain, persecution, can lack of clothes and food, danger to life and limb, the threat of forces of arms, Indeed, some of us know the truth of the ancient text. For your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Suffering should never drive us away from God. It should bring us to him. Because in our suffering, we are becoming like him, he who suffered for us. And we understand that our suffering is drawing us to God, not away from him. Verse 37. No, in all these things we win an overwhelming victory through him who has proven his love for us. In all these things we are more than conquerors. We are overwhelming victory. Through what? Through the troubles and through the persecution, through the not having clothes or food and danger of life and threatened to be killed and armament and people who are searching to kill us. We are like sheep being brought to the slaughter we, are, we win victoriously over all of these things. <laughs> Verse 38. I haven't become absolutely convinced. So here's Paul. Neither death nor life, neither messengers of heaven, angels of heaven or demons, nor political monarchs of the earth, neither what happens today nor what may happen tomorrow, neither a power from on high nor a power from below, nor anything else in God's whole world has any, power to, has any power to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Nothing has the power to separate us from the love that is in Jesus Christ. <laughs> what an experience that we live in these things and nothing can take us away from it. Nothing can come between us. Now, there's a lot more that I have, but I was thinking for what, what is it that really sets the tone for problems and when things don't work out? Well, we know that Jesus, he knew the plan for his life. He knew the reason he was here. He knew that he was the Messiah. He knew that he had to die for our sins. And we have the transcripts, basically, of, of that in the Gospels. But one of the things that, is, that stands out for, for myself is in Matthew 26, 20. And this is when Jesus and the disciples are at the Last Supper. And I won't go th through it completely, but when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Jesus knows what it is like to have his closest friends betray, abandon. He knows what it's like for the people that he came to serve and to save, want to kill him. He knew that the anger and the resentment of the Romans against the Jews, that he was going to be the whipping post for all of their hatred and all of their anger towards being in that part of the country. He knew, what the, phys he knew the physical pain, the emotional pain, the psychological pain, all of these things the being abandoned, even by 
going to the Father. He says, Father, if there's another way, let this cup pass for me. So he felt, he, he felt as if we were even abandoned by the God the Father. But he knew that he wasn't, but he became that sacrifice. So when things go wrong, it's not wrong to say, God, I feel abandoned. Jesus did. And he told that Judas, you know, he pointed out that Judas was going to betray him, and Judas left. And then we have verse 26. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Jesus was establishing a bond with his disciples. He is establishing a bond with us every time we take communion. Every time we take the bread and the juice, we are being bonded to Jesus. That his broken body was the blood, the, the, the bread that was broken for us. Verse 27, Jesus, then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. And the covenant is, I make an unbreakable agreement with you. I make an unbreakable pact with you, my brethren, and all who will follow. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, we have different names, the Lord's Supper, which, because of it, um, commemorates the Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciple. We have the Eucharist. I never think to call it the Eucharist because other denominations call it the Eucharist, and we're not like them, but the word Eucharist means thanksgiving. In it, we thank God for Christ's work for us. That's what the definition is. And communion, because through it, we commemorate with God and with other believers that we are in communion together. And then, verse 30, he sung a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Psalm 118. This is what Jesus sang. Now I'm just going to read different verses. But Psalm 118, when you get a chance, read the whole thing. Verses 1 through 7. So this is what Jesus sang. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. When hard-pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. When life is crushing, God brought me into a spacious place. <laughs> the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? He's facing the garden and the crucifixion. He's singing this. The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. Then jump down to verse 15. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live. <laughs> and will proclaim the Lord what the Lord has done. Then verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. <laughs> Jesus is singing his victory as he's walking out with his disciples to go to the garden to face Gethsemane. In verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he made, us, he made his light shine on us. With bow in hand, join in festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Oh, let's sing. Let's go to the altar and grasp, as it were, the horns of the altar and become the sacrifice for the people. When things go wrong, remember what things are right. When things are facing us 
always re- and we feel crushed, remember that we're always on the rock. And whenever we're standing on the rock, Christ Jesus, we are, have a firm foundation. So things really haven't been crushed, they've been rearranged. <laughs> and it, instead of slamming the door on our fingers, he wants us to look at life from a divine perspective because he has a plan for us. And just as Jesus sang the hymn of the psalm here, he, ha- he knew that the Father and he had a plan for this moment in time. And so when things go wrong, remember what is right. That nothing can separate us from the love of God. That there nothing can come between the love of God and us. For God has a way of working everything out to a divine good. Doesn't mean he instigated it. It means that he controls it. Because I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. And no matter what happens in your life, I will fulfill that plan. Amen? Father, we thank you for the plan, the purpose, the position that we have in you. That nothing is greater than your love and nothing is greater than your mercy. We know that you go before us. You prepare a path and a a way before us. You give us strength and wisdom and power. You give us grace and mercy. You give us (laughs) the ability to stand when all else fails. It's in your grace and mercy and in the power of your word and of your spirit. We ask, Lord, for you now to make these things real to us. Help us, Lord, to pray. Pray for your grace and mercy to be abundant in our life. We pray for your grace and mercy to touch the lives of those who don't know you. That, God, they may come to this realization that you love them more than they could ever know. So, Lord, we just reach out to those that we name in our minds and hearts. We reach out to them, and we pray, God, together that you will touch their hearts, bring them back to a right relationship with you. And, Lord, we will thank you and praise you for that which was impossible, Lord, has come to pass. Thank you, Jesus. For hearing our prayers. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.